Wexler. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful, as always, Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're on episode 153. Uh, well, like you're heading towards the three-year anniversary. Absolutely. We've only got another couple and then it's there. And what oh we're going to be talking God. about this one, which I love this topic, Bob, because I talk about this an awful lot, is making peace with your inner critic in the therapy process. My well, inner critic title. is always chirruping away. <laughs> Wonderful title again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just say it again. How to... Making peace with your inner critic in the therapy process. Okay. So if we were to look at one of the major outcomes of a psychotherapy treatment process, even if our clients don't say this in this sort of language, this is probably one of the outcomes. Yes. That the client can eventually get some peace from the never-ending critic which is usually pecking away at the head heart and spirit yeah i think there's lots of different names for what we refer to as the inner critic often the name of you well yeah often people call it mind monkeys do you know what i mean it's just when you you're trying to do something and then there's just that little voice in your head that's saying things like "Mm, should you really be doing that or it won't work out it never works for you, all those sort of things that we wouldn't dream of saying to anybody else. But for some reason, that internal dialogue goes on in our head. Yeah, or the toxic parent. Yeah, absolutely. Or the negative parent. Yeah. Or the critical parent. Because that's where it all comes from, isn't it? Well, sometimes in TA, you see, transaction analysis again, Eric Byrne talked about the negative controlling parent. All the same sort of terminology, really. It might have got changed over the years or by different disciplines, but it's the um, that narrative which is continually dismissing, attacking, yeah. diminishing um, our sense of self. Yeah. And we're both parents, and I don't want to be slating all parents, but it, it's usually our main caregiver or somebody that we've, I don't know, respected or has meant a lot to us in our upbringing. So it could be a teacher, it could be an aunt, it could be a foster care or grandparents or whatever. It's somebody in our past that has kind of said certain things or we've got a feeling from them. They've not necessarily given us a direct message, but it's kind of like the understanding that we have. Yeah, and that we take on um, by osmosis, or some people might say an unconscious process. Yeah. The po- process which is often outside our awareness. Yeah. And one of the biggest jobs a therapist has, I think, in this context, is to facilitate the client to understand that this critic, TA negative parent, did you say monkey business or monkeys? Yeah, some... Mind monkeys, just mind those little monkey. monkeys that are chirping <laughs> away. Yeah. <laughs> Actually comes from an outside source. Yes. And it's not ourselves. Yeah. I think that's the, the, the important thing that it's not our voice that's in there. Yeah. Even though we feel or might think that it's actually ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that it is just a thought. We don't need to believe the things that it's saying, but we do. <laughs> well, we take these narratives or if we want to want a technical word, our interjected parental messages, the negative yeah. ones I'm talking about here, not the positive ones. Yeah. Uh, the critic ones. Um, very early on. 
and they become part of our personality, which is why we often think it's ourselves rather than imported from somewhere else. Yeah. As I said, the major job I think of a therapist in this context is to help the client be aware that this negative critic we're talking about here comes from elsewhere and is imported in rather than from themselves, which they often think it is. And again, I know we've said it in previous podcasts and everything. I think you hit on it there when you said to become aware of. Awareness for me is key to everything. Mm. You know, that it's like a running commentary that's always running in the background, but often we're not even aware of it. But yeah, it does often dictate the behaviour that we take in certain situations. Mm. Mm. That's correct. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the biggest question I could ask you and I ask myself in this podcast is how do we facilitate the clients to be aware that actually the negative critical parent that they they listen to and often attack themselves with comes from an external source and it is not them. How do we help the client actually come to that point of awareness? That's a really good point. I, I, mean, I start with you. Well, I sometimes ask, you know, clients whose voice is it? Mm. Yeah. Basically. And is that enough in itself? Well, it's, it's, it starts the conversation, mm. do you know what I mean, to, to look at the, is it your voice? Do you believe that it is your voice? And then you, we can start to kind of start the conversation about, okay, so whose voice is it? Right. So let me give you a negative rhetoric, which is often so common when people come into therapy and talk about being very hard on themselves. Or I might ask that question. Are you very hard on yourselves? Yeah. And I say yes. So sort of thing they might say to themselves is, I've got it wrong again. Yeah. I'm really stupid. I can never get things right. I have no value. I'm worthless. I might as well give up. I can never get things right. I'm completely wrong. I never amount to anything. Yeah. Those are common internal critic voices which a person might report when they talk about being hard on themselves as a narrative that comes internally rather than externally. Yeah. So the question is, like you've just said, um, and where did you where did you, have you heard this narrative before or where did you get this narrative or how did you come to this conclusion or has anybody said similar things to you yeah are you always this hard on yourself has this come from your history is there a pattern here is this useful this language yeah because it sounds like this type of narrative will only have one function and that's to diminish your sense of self and deplete your self-esteem yeah yeah i think when i ha have had this conversation with clients one of the first things that they'll say if i say that you know has anybody ever said this to you or you know can you remember a time where somebody said this or whatever they've always said no so from that i would then say the feeling that is attached to it or how you feel is that familiar to you and then what happens when you say that then they can make a connection <clears throat> to somebody or a, a time in their life where they felt that same feeling that's attached to it rather than the actual words being spoken mm. so they might not remember the narrative yeah or put it another way they might not allow themselves to put that connection together of whose narrative actually is absolutely i think that's a really important point yeah it's different but what you're saying is they may actually feel what it's like and usually it's how they the feelings of how 
they are when those things are told to them it's usually what they remember yeah and they may from that make a connection of who actually says it yeah even if it's a commoleration of people in other words it's it's uh, more than one yeah absolutely so for example if you come from a big family of 11 people for example it's often might be the older brothers or sisters as they work up the chain yes yeah because i think if 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 they do attach it to a person then there's there's a sense of of grief and loss potentially around that when they realize that you know it was a parent that said that to them or it was a parent that made them feel that way or a significant other yeah person, absolutely such as an yeah. older brother or sister yeah i mean another query on this is often and i might ask this oh that's interesting you're so hard on yourself and i just also interesting don't remember where it comes from however if we were to inquire further what do you think the psychological function might be of this dialogue which is so critical that you are imposing on yourself what do you think is the psychological function of that yeah and then they might say well there's none at all except that i feel bad oh so that might be the psychological function that you then feel bad and who might have wanted you in your history for not be one person might be part yeah. of yourself that wants you to feel so bad about yourself those are the sort of questions i think that's yeah. the sort of inquiry and they might say it's part of themselves by the way yes they might say oh it's just that that part of himself which always wants to tell me off and then the next question is oh and where do you think the other part of you has learned this from so you're aiming towards like you've just said jackie they may they're making some sort of connection with this negative critique is imported in from somewhere yeah you see what usually happens when whether it be mother father brother older sister elder brother or whichever negative critique we're talking about here what usually happens is that the client changes the you yeah to an i absolutely yeah so you are this you are yeah. that you could be this you 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 are the negative the yeah. person got it wrong the person who won't amount to anything yeah you are the black sheep of this family you cause all the problems and if that's said over and over and over either verbally or non-verbally yeah especially the younger they are the client then decides or the person then decides or the child then decides i am that way they change the you to an I. Yeah. They take ownership of the I without, or it gets lost in time, with really understanding that it is actually imported from somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. Mm. And I like what you said earlier on about osmosis. That's a word that I use quite a lot, that it just kind of seeps in. <laughs> we, And I think one of the reasons I think that that is is because we trust those people around us that they've got our best interests at heart so we don't tend to filter out those messages mm. as yeah. an adult now and in the here and now if somebody was saying those things to me I wouldn't take them on board <laughs> I'd probably think they're having a bad day or what's wrong with them whereas the age that we're starting to to notice this we're too young to filter it out or to work it out whether it's true or or not true mm. so we just absorb it okay so if we follow this through as they start to make the awareness or connection or take ownership that this is imported material yeah and not something from birth they've suddenly decided but they've decided these things in uh impact from what has come from somewhere else so they start to differentiate out and take ownership of this difference 
they then can start through our help to take ownership of their own power and self-agency back from what they gave away. Yeah. And that sounds like a really good process, but it's quite difficult to do. <laughs> well, it's quite a lengthy process. And the first yeah. place, and I know you like this, what I'm going to say, and I, I do as well because I have the same belief systems. The first place is awareness and connection. Yes. Yeah. And not your awareness and connection, them making an awareness and connection that this critique they're always telling themselves isn't them telling it themselves it actually comes from somewhere else yeah and how come they're believing that and yeah. where it all comes from so that's the first step the awareness and connection of this process how you get to it i believe is um through inquiry questions yeah um, also helping the clients see that often this narrative is taken um, from an external place, parent will say here in TA terms, as adult reality, as if it was true now. Yes, yeah. Which in TA we call contaminations. So we have to start helping the person make awareness. As they start to do that, the next step is to help them in their story make connections with who might have said that or where does that come from. Many may come from many sources in the family. It might come from teachers, it might come from abusers, it might come from brothers, sisters, it come, could, could come from the church, it could come from many places. And help them trace this back yeah which because, takes time ab absolutely but if we can work out the source then we can start to pull apart the story that we make up about it if that makes sense yeah and usually what we come across is loyal children yes yeah most people are very loyal to a significant other people who yeah. are in charge of them. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you start, if they start, um, you know, realizing or making connections that those people, you know, are actually saying these negative things to them, that a lot comes from that, Jackie. Firstly, of course. They are then, you know, starting to perhaps think of their significant others who were part of that process as not okay. And once they start doing that, yeah, that starts to change their whole script. And there's a lot to that as they start to unpick all that. It's not straightforward. Absolutely. And that, that that is a massive shift in things. And sometimes I think for me, that was one of the hardest things when I was going through my own personal therapy because it's kind of like your whole story falls apart somehow. Mm. Even though the story isn't a good one as it stands, at least it's a story and it, it's an anchor. Whereas mm. when we start to look at it and, and understand where it's coming from and why we've got it, everything kind of changes after that mm. oh i like that word anchor because those that story that we've developed you know about ourselves other people in the world provides predictability yeah identity yeah stability continuity all those things which make up our life story about ourselves, other people in the world. Yeah. Now, as we start to change that, um, we then start to feel often very uncomfortable. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, some of the conversations that I've had with clients in the past, they're like, you know, why would I want to keep this story or this script alive when I feel as bad as I do? Mm. But York. that is exactly it because it's familiar, because we know it, it's an anchor, it's our kind of safety mechanism to a certain extent. So to let that go, we're floundering. Yeah. The psychological functions of keeping that going is to provide predictability. Yeah. Continuity. Yeah. Psychological stability. Uh, and a confirmation of how we see ourselves and our life and our identity yeah so that's those are the reasons how come we spend so much energy yeah and so much time in continuing this story about ourselves uh and ta often called our script yeah that are the people ourselves in the world now this type of script or this type of narrative depletes any self-esteem that we might have actually managed to garner about ourselves. Yeah. So we have to tackle this uh, and the psychological functions of this type of negative critique that we say to ourselves to enable the person to develop more self-esteem, esteem, confidence, in themselves and in the world and feel better yeah and one feeds the other when we're in a good place we can kind of understand it more and we can build our self-esteem but when we're not in a good place when we're tired or overwhelmed or anything that's the time where we can kind of slip back into it because it's familiar we know how it works couldn't you couldn't have said that better the more stressed we are yeah the more likely we are to fall into our um, habitual patterns and our, the elements of our negative script. Yeah. When we are feeling more vulnerable and stressed. Is Somebody the... asked me a question. A client, well, I was having this discussion with a client um, last week <clears throat> or the week before, and they asked me a, a, a really, well, I thought it was quite a pertinent question, and I've never been asked it before. Because we were talking about the, the life script and I was having this conversation about how we can get out of our script. And he said, so is that it then? Once you get out of your script, you never go back to it. And I said, well, no, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> we, we, you know, life throws us a curveball or life events happen and everything. And we will go back. And he, he said, to, what's the point? And I said, well, the point is we're more aware of when we're in it. And then we have a choice to step out of it. I still go back into my script, I, I, but I know when I'm in it now. It's not out of my awareness anymore. And sometimes I want to be in it, if I'm being perfectly honest. Yeah, because you then know who you are from all these years ago. But let's go back to what you just said. What is the question you haven't been asked before? Do we, once we step out of it, do we never go back in it again? And you've never been asked that before? No. Not variation? No. Oh, okay. So, so I think the way you responded to that question is really positive. That exactly what you just talked about. That by understanding the pitfalls, the understanding our vulnerability, and understanding that under stress, we're likely to allow those uh, negative, critical voices to be more powerful. And we'll allow ourselves to fall into our negative stories. Um, and if we become aware of all those things we just talked about, we can step away from that negative story and start creating our own yeah. positive story instead of someone else's. Yeah. Because what we're talking about here, Jack, is that we are living somebody else's version of ourselves. Yeah. We are living somebody else's version of ourselves. And we believe it. That's the believe thing. It. We believe it. So of it, course we do. True, because yeah. It comes, it comes from those very important, significant other people who have spent such a long time defining us in such a way. Yeah. 
that what else could we believe because we don't know anything else yeah but now however long decades it is um they till the client can't accept the discomfort anymore and they come to therapy we can help them you know take back of their own versions of themselves again yeah and take ownership of those versions now that's not a sh that is not a six session process no this takes time but in answer to the question the person asks is why would you do well why wouldn't you do it yeah <laughs> yeah Absolutely. why would you stay with those processes that uncomfortability that discomfort that negative version of yourself why wouldn't you and of course the question the answer to that one is well because i feel so vulnerable in giving these or this understanding of my story up because what do i put in its place yeah who am i <laughs> yeah who am i that's yeah. it that's the essential question who am i and who are you yeah and that's scary and you know again that's something that i will often say to clients is when we're doing this work you know there is the the chance that you will feel anxious you will feel a shift at certain times when you're stepping out of your script but that is okay because it is new and it is different i saw a film in 2011 for the first time which had one of my favorite actresses in it Anne hathaway yeah I was, it was called one day and it traced um the eight, the twenty-one-year-old Anne Hathaway, whose name I can't remember off the top of the head, the character she played, but she was just leaving Edinburgh University, or she was just graduating, and she met a fellow student, which she'd seen around before and really found attractive. I think the graduation party or whatever it was, and they met up for one night. They didn't actually um, come back that into the future that. They met up on July the 15th, which is since Swithin's Day. And they decided that they were going to meet up every year or get in touch at least every year on July the 15th for the rest of their lives. Oh. And the film takes us through the next 25 years of each one of these days where they meet up or keep in contact with each other and how their lives change and doesn't change and how they're so interwined together over the next 25, 26 years. And you see the script or the life plan or what they've decided with themselves and each other and the impact of those two scripts together over the next 20 years and their different developmental processes that go through and how it ends. I won't tell you the ending, in case no, you don't, because I might Google it and see if I can watch because it. Because the new version of that, like, you know, Star and Born, you get one version of it goes through the different geckos. Yeah. Popped into my Netflix four weeks ago. Yeah. Anne Hathaway's, you know, these two different act, act, and actresses and actors. Um, and it's got 12 episodes to it, so it's in more fuller version than the film. Um, though I did enjoy the book as well. But it's a really good example of how we play out our script and we find people to yes. play out our scripts with us and how we can how we develop or change or don't yeah as the years go on yeah which is I think what i'm talking it, about here yeah uh, and it, it i think in my training it was like literally when we talk about a life <laughs> script it is like a, a, a drama or an episode of coronation street or something because we decide who who comes into it and who we're going to have relationships with and everything. But it's kind of predetermined in a way by those messages and that internal critic of our perception of ourself and who we will be in a relationship with. Absolutely. Which is shocking when you think about it. Yeah. But, you know, do we, do we have free will? Well, the next bit is what we do as therapists <clears throat> in helping the client give back and take ownership 
of those negative messages how do we actually do it now you and i have probably got different styles again in this <clears throat> um and you can do it from help the client make awareness is through inquiry and in transaction analysis terms again stay in their adoric state or stroke and you can use regression to help the client go back to the younger self when these messages and early negative critiques were actually given to them and through role play in the regressive process you can help the person give back those messages to where they first came yeah and then to help them put a new script on the road as eric burns said yeah do you think occasionally sometimes... yeah now and again i do think sorry i'm jacking do i think what no do you think that sometimes our scripts are generational they're always generational what else could there be yeah because I can remember something in my training about, I think it was your darling wife, Steffi. Definitely, yeah. That was saying about, it's like an amphitheatre. Yes. And all these yes. people in there. Yes. And it's about giving yes. it back to the person it originally came from type of thing. I don't know if it was a visualisation thing no, that she got them doing. Absolutely but, yeah. correct. On my, I have very, very a few photographs of uh, myself when I was younger, and very few photographs of my um, adopted mother. I, but I have one on my phone. And I was looking at, I don't often look at these pictures, but I was looking at her and she was about, whoa, I don't know, 44 in the picture. And as I looked at the, I remember, I rem <clears throat> I thought of what she said about her mother to me. Yeah. And how much she found her mother a cold fish. And that's the way I saw my own mother. Yeah. So she talked about her mother as being a cold fish and never expressing any love to her. I would say exactly the same thing about my mother as a cold yeah. fish that doesn't express any love. There's a generational script. Yeah. The etiology of a generational script, the beginning of a generational script, and many other things. But that's, that's a good example of yeah. how things are passed down or how people's experiences, images are passed down and the stories that are passed down and what we make sense of when my mother says, well, you're, you know, my mother was a cold fish and didn't express any emotion to me at all. What I, as I experienced that myself from my own mother, what I then decide. Yeah. Do I then <clears throat> eventually out of awareness pass down to my own? Never. <clears throat> because, well, I'm, you know, I've never have um, for lots of different reasons, um, mainly because of the therapeutic journey I've been in because I was uh, in therapy way before I had my daughter. And I I knew the powerfulness of script and what not to pass down. I so think, generational scripts are very important. Yeah, I think that's the thing for me that I love about psychotherapy is that once we're aware and we have choices, then you <clears> know <throat> those choices are so important that we can stop that generational thing do you know what I mean and we can choose to be different with our children oh. but we need that awareness of it I think this should be taught in flipping schools you know a lot of the time <laughs> I was very fortunate to before Jessica was born in 1999 and I was 48 so quite getting on in life um god knows what I would have been like at 28 because I wouldn't have had any therapy, or I wouldn't have had any understanding myself, and any of the things we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I would have passed down a very different life script because I wouldn't have had any knowledge of any difference. Yeah. It was the therapeutic process I've had for many years that allowed me to, I hope, not understand understand these generational scripts, 
but to change them. Yeah. So I, an I, interesting I, conversation, Bob. <clears throat> yeah. So this is how I think we start um, desensitizing ourselves to these critical messages and taking ownership of a different way of being so we can have a different destiny for ourselves, children, and if we don't have children for ourselves and people around ourselves. Yeah. I think one of the things I do sort of short term with, with clients sometime, again, for me, it's about increasing their awareness on things. And I call it taking the thoughts to court. Yeah, <laughs> and, I love that phrase of yours. And, you know, getting them to challenge that negative you know, that internal critic that they're getting, that you're not successful, you're not good enough, you're not the... Think of a time where you have been good enough and you have been successful and yeah. trying to get them to reframe it, Um, yeah. you know, in the short term. Obviously, there's a lot of deeper work that needs to go... Yeah, you could on. set it out through aggressively a court drama. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And that's what I picture in my head when I say take it to court. You are literally looking for evidence... Mm. Do you know to be to discount that thought? Yeah. Yeah, and of course, psychodrama, all the you know, these other types of psychotherapy, uh, which you, we can use in transaction analysis to actually create that court that you're talking about, so yeah. that you're trying to take ownership of what is so different and what should have been. Yes. Yeah. Denied them. Yeah. yeah. And again, that's a grieving process a lot of the time. Oh, well, that's, the yeah, that's the bit. Yeah, that's the bit we haven't mentioned on this podcast. Yeah. Is the loss of what could have been. Yes. And the celebration of what new ways we are. Yeah. On board and our different destinies. But you're right. The loss of what could have been and should have been yeah so that's so, the deeper work that, and that's why none of this is a quick fix <laughs> oh this this is not a quick fix yeah it could not be a quick fix yeah again I, I i i think i've really enjoyed that i love talking about the inner critic probably because mine is so very strong bob <laughs> and you well, know Often yeah. I talk about having to have your hands on the steering wheel all the time because if ever I let it go, it's so easy to just revert back into those thoughts. I, I consciously have to yeah. challenge them. Yeah. yeah, and I think for those people, you know, listening to podcasts, therapists and clients alike, uh, alike who might be therapists, by the way, I really want to give a plea here for relational psychotherapy. Yeah. In other words, the this isn't about doing this yourself. You can't do this yourself. You need, it, you need to have a protective witness on the journey to be there for you as you start to not only make the connections, but actually perhaps giving back which, what was never yours. I think for me, one of the things that I got that was so powerful on my the psychotherapy journey as a, a client was validation yes for the experience or what how I felt or, or whatever it was it was having that external validation for me that was so powerful mm. and that has to come from the therapist on the journey it can come from other people around but in terms of the transference which I you know is so important here that the therapist is a protective positive yeah. other to be able to stand up to often the negative critics in our head. Yeah. Because if the therapist can't do that, the client repeats history. Yeah. And again, you know, another thing, I, I love my training, Bob. I sing your praises all the bloody time. Oh, I hope you know it. It's that permission, protection, and potency. Yeah. It's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The therapist, I hope, think that way because we're so important to our clients yeah in this journey we're talking about here they cannot do it themselves yeah and it, 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 yeah i agree i my first job when i left school was to be a hairdresser oh wow and i refer to counseling the same as a hairdresser <laughs> i can't do my own hair 
No, you can't. Because I can't give therapy to myself. I need to go to a hairdresser's to get a decent haircut. You know, I can trim it a little bit and I can do bits and bobs, but I can't see the back of my head, so I can't do it myself. And it's similar to I can't give myself psychotherapy. No, we do need to have a therapist that is on our side and is powerfully on our side and will stay around and be there for our journey. Yeah, I think it's a relationship that you can't replicate in any other area of your life. No, No, and rightly so. Yeah, absolutely. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. What we'll be looking at in the next one is overcoming child neglect in therapy. Another Go together. Yes, absolutely. Bye-bye, see you then. See you soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.